everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Futurum Tech Podcast. I'm Daniel Newman, host today, founder and CEO at the Futurum Group. And we're going to be talking about AI today. Yep, we're starting 2024 where we left off 2023. But the good news is we're going to be bringing some new insights, perspectives, and we're going to bring a little science to this. And of course, everyone's going to say, oh, it's all science. But we're going to bring a little bit of the social science. We're going to bring a little bit of the thoughtful science about this particular area of interest and how it's going to really play out over the next 12 months. And we'll also talk a little bit about an AI manifesto from Pega, who will be providing our guest today, as well as a little bit of an overview of their upcoming event, Pega World, that will be later this year. So without further ado, I want to welcome Peter Van Der Putten to the show. Peter, welcome to the Future of Tech Podcast. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. It's great to kick off the year. You know, you saw me in the preamble there kind of talking a little bit about what I call the science and the social science of what's going on in AI. We saw over the last, uh, I don't know, let's call it 14 months, 13 months, November 2022, a new generative AI tool came out and it was kind of like AI had just been invented for the first time. Now, anybody, including yourself, myself, that's been around the industry knows that's just emphatically not true. But there's always these sort of inflection points that create what I would call mass adoption, commercialization, where something goes from being used maybe in the labs, um, in the academic and research centers, maybe by very small subsets of enterprise, you know, maybe like quantum computing is today is where AI was for some period of time, and then it breaks free, and then it breaks free at scale. And that was really, I think, to some extent, what we saw in 2023. And we're gonna talk about that here on the show, but how about before we jump in and, and talk about that, Give me the quick background on your role. You're the lead scientist, director of Pega's AI lab. How did you get there? Give me a little bit of the backstory and uh, you know, talk a little bit about what you do every day. No, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I, if I go uh, way back, uh, I studied uh, AI. I, I actually started to study that in 1989. So it's uh, quite a while ago, a couple of summers, AI summers ago, basically. Um, and then, uh, but I was always very much interested in uh, not just AI as a technology, but also what is the impact on uh, business? What is the impact on society? What is the impact on people? Uh, how do you apply it also in a in a responsible manner? So um, yeah, that, that's that's why I really moved into um, yeah in, into the area of you know how 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 can we how can we generate value with AI in business? not just for businesses, but also for customers alike. Yeah, so, uh, uh, and, and at PEGA, I'm, I'm heading up the uh, AI lab. So uh, basically I'm looking at uh, not just, you know, how our clients can get better value out of AI, but also applying it to, uh, to our own company, you know, coming up with new improvements, innovations, be it completely on the business end or completely on the technical end, uh, leveraging AI. Yeah, it's a, it's a big role. And uh, when did you start? How long have you been here in this role? Ooh, um, so I've been in the uh, this uh, the AI lab since uh, we started at April two years ago. Uh, but I've been focusing on AI at Pega. If I cheat a little bit with two M and A's in between uh, since two thousand two, yep. and uh, before that I was working at uh, an AI research company. Yeah, so Peg has been talking about AI for a long time. And, uh, you know, I, I still remember some of the keynotes, software that writes software, or, you know, some of the, this was said, and I still remember one of the quotes, and, and, I, and I, I can't give it attribution, but it came from a Peg world, you know, someone basically gave us this breakdown of, you know, Facebook knows you better than you know yourself. And this, I mean, and this is a, this is five years ago, six years ago, because this was pre, uh, you know, the, the C-19 stuff. And it was a presentation that was kind of done that was helping, you know, kind of end next best action technologies and understanding how this technology could parallel to basically help people and help companies to better deliver enterprise solutions, customer experiences. So this isn't a new thing for, for Pega. It's great to see that there's investment being made. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about something, you know, that, you know, we call right brain, left brain AI. Um, 
this is something that I've heard from Pega and from you guys. Talk a little bit about what this, what that is, because I know right brain, left brain from a, you know, the standard sort of anthropological standpoint, but what do you mean when you, when you apply that to AI? Yeah, like so I use it as a bit of a metaphor because it's easy to get lost there with all the hype around chat GPT and whatnot. I loved your preamble when you said like uh, people acted as if AI came out of nowhere a, a year ago. Um, maybe for, uh, let's say, the AI, uh, whatever, the AI geeks, they were like, well, uh, no, we've had AI for uh, for a long time. But I, get, I think you're really right. You're spot on uh, in the sense that, um, well, uh, first AI up until, uh, like I said, I studied in the 80s up until the mid 90s was primarily in the labs. Then it moved more into the mainstream in the sense that uh, even if you Google or if you uh if you you know uh, search a particular destination in Google Maps uh, or you're, you're shopping on Amazon, uh, AI you know uh, you're being exposed to AI tens of times or hundred times per day. But as a, a average consumer, yeah, you you didn't really uh, you didn't really experience that. And I think ChatGPT was the first time, uh, more from indeed uh, making it accessible point of view, the first time for many people that they. Uh, essentially became a maker of AI. They got like a little peek under the hood. If you're doing your clever prompt engineering uh, to uh, create a more uh, even cuter corgi in uh, Dali, uh, or if you're if you are trying to uh, you're you're a kid doing his homework uh, with uh, ChatGPT, uh, you're fooling around with the prompts to see if you can get the right answer. So I think that kind of explains a little bit why for many people um, ChatGPT was their first kind of exposure, their first conscious exposure to, to AI. And ChatGPT is a form of right brain AI because it's it's what we call generative AI, uh, almost like the creative AI. It's AI that, that generates new stuff, text, images, whatever. Uh, but, but next to that right brain AI, we, we've had this kind of left brain AI already for a long time. And uh, our, our left brain is primarily concerned with uh, making smart decisions or as humans, we at least we think we're making uh, smart decisions. Uh, so there's the many um, actions we could take and, you know, which one is the right one based on predicted outcome, uh, predicted success, uh, etc. And I think uh, in, in that sense, that metaphor of left brain and right brain, it can help a little bit to navigate this whole AI uh, landscape. We have generative AI, which is more the, the right brain AI, the creative AI, but there's all these other forms of, uh, of AI uh, predictive analytics, uh, natural language processing, uh, uh, real-time decisioning, uh, which which fit better in this kind of left brain category. Yeah, that's actually really interesting, and and I think that's kind of the another way to say this was sort of like AI BG before generative and AI after generative AG BG and AG. And, and the reason I point that is you know generative. Um, you know, provided a certain set of capabilities that were are very obvious, you know, like text creation, image creation. Um, but the all the stuff that I would kind of call before generative was were the really kind of enterprise practical apps, you know, the things like uh, workflow optimization, automation, you know, process uh, optimization, you know, analytics, deep uh, analytics, you know, that could be used for understanding churn or understanding, you know, customer probability. And, and these were things that, by the way, you'd go to Wall Street, you go to Madison Avenue, you go to, you know, uh, the across social media platforms. This has been done for some time. Anybody that's played with a Netflix recommender engine and knows like, oh, that really is the kind of show I would want to watch or that, you know, the, you know, this is what, it, you know, NVIDIA has done for a long time with its filter, uh, you know, with uh, Merlin and, and Jasper and these different tools. And the point was, you know, this has been a thing for some time, but people are just really starting to recognize it. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah, so that's I, it was so well done, so hidden from everything we that we. It was so hidden that we really didn't really experience it as as a consumer, not not in a conscious fashion, right? So it's, it's ubiquitous, right? It's I hidden. Mean, it's seamless. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, but, uh, and, and I think that's in, in a way the beauty of, of, of ChatGPT and those type of generative AI tools that it makes you more of a maker. It makes you, uh, you you're, it's not, no, no longer just the AI Illuminati who are controlling it, uh, but it's also 
uh, your your mom, you know, creating, a, you know, recite, you know, finding a new recipe for an apple pie, yeah, or your kid doing uh, doing their homework, right? Well, so, and it's nice and it's important huh, because this is a, I mean, uh, at risk of uh, sounding a bit cliche, uh, it is a transformative technology, right? So, uh, b- both for business but also for society, and and we all need to be part of it, right? So to make sure that that you know. Um, uh, that yes, you know, as a business, we can uh, use it to become more profitable, but also in a way that customers actually like uh, like it, and that it's actually to to the benefit of the customer yeah, in terms of getting better service or more relevant recommendations or uh, you know um, more optimal frictionless uh, experiences, uh, and not that we feel whatever spied on or uh, uh, or not in a way where we would feel you know being at a being disadvantaged because the decisions that are being made are not fair, for example. Well, privacy is something that will always have a, a bit of a, a, a continuum of control. And obviously, the less private we are, the better and more targeted a lot of these things can be. But having said that, it's, you know, we don't always necessarily want that. Um, but there is a sort of symbiotic relationship between the two. You know, as you kind of said it, like the deep analytics that maybe were, you know, left brain that helped a company say, you know, this customer is likely to leave provided the right brain an opportunity to say, let's generate something, text, an offer that can now be put in front of them. That's like, this is a way we're going to try to handle retention. So we're going to write a nice letter. We're going to talk about all the good times we've had together, all the great things our current customers are experiencing by being more loyal. Oh, here's an offer we're going to provide you to stay as a customer. What I'm saying is, and then instead of historically where, you know, someone would have to kind of find that in analytics and then you'd have to assign somebody and say, all right, let's get on this. Let's create a custom project program or a template, which, by the way, would often be templated and not specific enough. Now it can create very quickly a generative thing that is very specific to that person that can consider both PII data as well as using text generation to say, all right, but we're going to get the exact offer in the right. So there's a tie between these things, right? Right and left brain. Be right and left brain AI become very symbiotic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you ultimately you'll get the best results uh, if you combine it too. Uh, you know, if we would be humans walking around only with the right brain or only with the left brain, you probably sometimes encounter individuals like that. Uh, but uh, you'll experience that that's not uh, that's that's not like uh, um, uh, uh, not preferred. You know, like uh, likewise in, in in AI. You know, if you if you're able to combine left brain and right brain, yeah, that, that's a great combination. Yeah? The example that you give here is more, let's say, in uh, one-to-one marketing, uh, uh, creating all kinds of creatives that, that that better resonate with particular needs and interests of customers, but use the left brain to really understand, like, yeah, um, uh, what is it what a particular customer actually needs here in the moment, yeah? Or in customer service, it could be figuring out... Um, yeah, what is the issue that the customer likely has so that we can help the customer uh, quicker. Um, but generative AI could also be used for things like, oh, uh, let's summarize this entire conversation that if uh, halfway I need to transfer you to an, to another agent, I don't need to explain myself again, you know, as a, as a customer, right? So uh, here are some, these are some good examples of left brain and right brain actually working together in symbiosis. So, so Future of Intelligence that recently did a decision-making dashboard where we actually reached out to over a thousand enterprise buyers of, of AI to get a better understanding of kind of directionally what's going to happen in 2024. A couple of things that we founded were one, you know, customers are still having a lot of sort of, um, they're doing a lot of vendor gymnastics to figure out who the right provider is. They're, you know, trying to find those that they can trust, A, understand the technology and B, know how to implement it. But we're also seeing that actually 23 was more of a, a, it was a bit misleading because while companies like NVIDIA sold lots of GPUs and cloud providers bought lots of GPUs to set up for AI, you actually heard companies like Cisco come out and they talked about, well, you know, we haven't gotten most of the stuff installed yet, meaning that like we have lots of backlog for hardware, meaning the implementation and the practical application of AI is really early days. We saw in our data, 300% of companies, uh, 300% more companies plan to spend over $2 million on AI implementation this year. So we're seeing a triple of companies that are starting to spend on the implementation of AI, not just buying hardware to support it. I'm curious from your lens, running the AI lab and you know talking to customers at PAGA, 
What are some of the trends you see in 2024? And is our data, you know, and seeing customers moving from proof of concept to bigger investment, is that what you're seeing and hearing on your end? Yeah, no, it's absolutely something we're seeing. Uh, like uh, like, like I, uh, we were discussing just before, uh, pre, pre-generative AI, you know, uh, pre-GA, that there's been tons of application of AI as well already, right? So, uh, but I think in the, in the generative AI space, uh, where 2023 was a lot about um, yeah, uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, generative AI models are coming out and, uh, uh, you know, this Cambrian explosion of, uh, of large language models, for example, uh, that will continue. Yeah? So in a way, yeah, you see Google coming out with Gemini, for example, um, open source uh, trying to make a play for it. Uh, but ironically, that Cambrian explosion of these large language models Will also lead to the to I think to more like that 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 market will become a bit more commoditized, and then actually the emphasis will shift more towards what you're saying. How are we going to apply this? You know, how can we, in that sense, uh, let's say enterprise generative AI at least uh, uh, uses the same technology that sits behind Bart or that sits behind Bing or uh, whatever, but the experience is very different. The experience is really something where you would build this generative AI into, yeah, into a particular workflow or into a particular interaction or into a particular uh, feature, right? So that also means that the emphasis shifts a bit from like, uh, yeah, which underlying model or service do I use that becomes less important. Actually, with that commoditization of that market, you want to be able to switch providers with the flip of a switch. The emphasis is much more on how can I build applications on top uh, uh, that would actually leverage uh, these underlying uh, foundation models. So that's that's where we see a lot of the emphasis uh, uh, shifting now, um, and because that's also where the real value is, uh, not, not whether you use model or service A, B, or C. First, we had no choice. Now we have more and more choice. So essentially, it becomes, uh, to some extent, a commoditized uh, uh, market, uh, but it is really trying to build these applications on top and features and workflows on top where you uh, where you build in the uh, generative AI. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of uh, consideration about consumption and how it's consumed. I think SaaS is really going to shine in the AI, generative AI era because people want the features and capabilities, but they don't really want to have to mess with all the infrastructure that requires to do it. Now, again, big companies will always have those challenges you, you know you if you're a massive enterprise government institution you've got lots of data and data sprawl and provenance and of course you've got um you know pe- technical debt of you know everything from your mainframes to your uh, you know data storage infrastructure to trying to get it you know everything available for utilization in ai having said that you know when you're kind of a newer company built on SaaS is going to be like hey how do we apply generative ai how do we apply uh you know it's going to be like, we can do this very simply on a subscription. We swipe a credit card. We can start using, you know, small data sets and everybody, you know, citizen data science becomes a real thing. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about through this conversation, but Gen AI, you know, hype, reality. Um, do you think to some extent, you know, I kind of kicked this pod talking off about how the hype kind of brought AI to the front, which is a good thing. But at the same time, like, you know, the practical application of AI is not only, and certainly won't only be generative. Is it is it eroding the business value that we're so focused on generative when there's so much more AI and AI capabilities that are not generative? Yeah, well, as an AI guy, I'm happy with any type of interest in AI, of course. Uh, but but you're right, you know. I think uh, there's a lot of both both the hype and the doomerism around AI, around Gen AI. It's, it's a bit counterproductive because, uh, the, you know, um, it's kind of, you know, getting the attention away from, let's say, a more pragmatic approach where you really look at, yeah, uh, what, what, what are the business outcomes that I want to optimize here, right? Uh, do I want to get better? Uh, do I want to provide more relevant experiences to my customers or uh, optimize my marketing campaigns or uh, do a better job at uh, handling uh, customer service issues? Uh, so uh, I think it starts with it. It should not start with the technology. It should start with, yeah, uh, what what are the business outcomes that I want to uh, want to optimize here, right? And then look very pragmatically for very practical uses and, and applications um, 
that would deliver the the highest bang for the buck. And then you will find out that there's yeah. Uh, uh, so that that for instance in the generative AI space, uh, that that uh, the most important thing is to find find those high you know low risk high uh, high return type use cases. Uh, uh, the example that I gave, whatever in customer service summarization of a call at the end of the call, uh, that that will it will save you. Well, at least ten seconds, fifteen seconds, if not more, on on every customer service call. So that that's that's an absolute, uh, that's an absolute no brainer uh, in that sense. And and the yeah. quality is way better too, right? I mean, the quality of you know, I've I've used the tools from some of the different, both the collab tools and the CX tools, and those summarizations are really good. I mean, summarization and then action and then assignment and all that stuff. I mean. It's game changing because, you know, you also were expecting those people to actually be able to figure out what the the crux of the call was, what the important stuff was. And the AI just tends to do a better job than your average call center worker in terms of figuring yeah, out. You, uh, if yeah. you ever, uh, if you were ever only receiving it, uh, like, uh, they're all, uh, they have this average handling time uh, target. So uh, they in the comments or the wrap up, they type in, hey, you type in the minimum amount of words and you hit enter off to the next customer, right? So, and that's, that's uh, where, you know, generative AI can really kind of make uh, a succinct, but but complete summary of all the things that happened. You change one or two bits and and, and, and off you go. And so agent happy, customer happy, uh, and because the next call, if I call in again as a customer, actually the, the, the agent I will talk to is way better informed. And so, um, yeah, uh, in, in principle, that's that that's a no-brainer. Yeah. So, but 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 what it boils down to is that you need to move away from this big like AI is going to be perfect or AI is going to be you know, a nightmare towards now. Let's let's be pragmatic. Uh, where where do we want to apply it? Uh, where can we have the biggest bang for the buck uh, and have a very pragmatic outcome-oriented, uh, uh, application-oriented. Uh, approach to uh, applying AI, uh, really looking for not the artificial intelligence, but the actionable intelligence. Uh, where, where, where can you put the intelligence to work uh, responsibly? Well, that's a great segue to the final topic here today, and that's going to be ethics. And, you know, we've heard throughout the year, uh, you know, the rapid onset of generative creates some real concern about ethics. We saw the New York Times recently uh, brought a lawsuit against OpenAI, and that's a, you know, kind of a combination of ethics and responsibility and, uh, you know, use uh, of copyright or potentially protected material. You know, we saw the first iteration of this use go through the search era, you know, but search had a much more clear path to attribution and monetization. Now, when you're seeing things abstracted and summarized, how do you how do you put preference? And then when you're abstracting, summarizing, and wanting to be accurate, you can't necessarily pay to have placement. And if you pay to have placement, that's going to always bring a challenge to the person willing to pay the most versus the highest quality. Um, it's no longer driven by an algorithm that's most, uh, you know, that was historically. So that's one thing. And then, of course, you have just overall privacy of data. You've got the security that generative and, and AI solutions. Uh, bringing risk to cyber, bringing risk to sovereignty, bringing risk to elections. So I'll give you kind of an open opportunity to talk because, you know, you, we can hit on all those things. But give me a little bit of just kind of your perspective on the ethical and responsible AI requirements. Uh, yep. what's yeah, I like that. So, uh, so indeed, uh, these are many of the aspects that you mentioned, uh, privacy, security, uh, copyright, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, typical other ones that people talk about is also bias and fairness. Uh, if you make automated decision. So if you're applying for a loan or uh, you do credit risk decisioning or um, uh, or you're investigating fraud, are you making making fair uh, fair decisions? So fairness is a big one. Uh, accountability. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, an organization should never be able to hide behind computer says no. Right. So ultimately, if you build some system, you know, whether it's a stupid system or a smart system, you're responsible for the decisions uh, that the system makes. So accountability is a big one as well. And so there's a range of those principles. Huh? But, and, but then also it means, you know, it's, it's, it's quite easy to, to get lost a little bit uh, in, in all of those principles. And then the more higher level principle is, is yeah, in a way, a lot easier. Uh, sometimes call it empathy, but... Uh, 
in principle, it means uh, don't do to others what you don't want to have done to yourselves, right? So you need to make sure that that if you have AI systems, they make automated decisions. Yes, as a company, you need to make a, a profit. It's fine, you know, uh, customers are not against that. But you need to make sure that you you balance uh, the, the, the various needs and um, um, uh, of, of, of the various stakeholders. Yeah, so... Uh, and if you do that well, I think that's the more higher level, um, uh, the more high level thing. Uh, what is my the objective of my AI system? Am I balancing balancing the various stakeholder needs, including the customer? Then I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, and then then you can also look at those other aspects. But I think that's actually the key thing that 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 customers and citizens care about. Uh, um, as long as you use it to the benefit of me, not just to the benefit of you as a company or as an organization or government, then I'm fine. Actually, I'm demanding you to make better use of, of you know, my data uh, to provide better service. And if you use it against me, I won't be happy about it. And so I think that's ultimately the same lesson that was learned in privacy. People are, customers are not against, you know, their data being used. Uh, actually, I want you to use my data if you use it to my uh, to my benefit yeah so i think that's maybe the higher level thing uh, to 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 think about uh, what we do see is that uh, there's this pendulum that first was like oh we'll all do like ethics and self regulation and eh? but it, that's moving now more towards um, yeah real regulation right so on this side, uh, side of the pond you know uh, my 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 accent kind of uh, uh, gives a hint, eh, but um, uh, I live in Europe where we have the EU AI Act that's going to be introduced. It's, it's about to be finalized. Eh? So that's real regulation around around AI. Eh, but it's not unique to uh, Europe. When you look to the US, eh, uh, Biden, of course, uh, he, he signed uh, an exact order uh, around AI. Not so far as regulation, but, but it was actually, uh, you know, I think it was quite a... Um, intelligent move on behalf of the Biden administration by 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 addressing, you know, uh, government procurement, etc., and uh, government agencies, etc., uh, to to reap the benefits of AI by doing it in a in a responsible manner. And that that's also a way to kind of influence uh, that that AI is being used in a good way. And I don't see that as as, you know, people position it sometimes as a trade off between innovation and regulation. I think this is a good example where both can go hand in hand. If it's a sensible regulation that kind of encourages trustworthy, responsible use of AI, that will only lead to more innovation in that particular area. And and, and also in terms of uh, uh, yeah, longer term acceptance by customers and by, by consumers of, of these technologies. So uh, we, we see that as a good thing. Well, Peter, there's a lot there to unpack, and uh, we're going to have to have to call it there. But uh, what I will do is make sure that in the show notes that we link to the AI manifesto that you mentioned. I think it's going to be a continuous conversation and debate as you know AI continues to proliferate, and you know people are always going to be balancing experiences uh, in exchange for data, and of course want to feel that their privacy is at least being managed by those that they are allowing their data. But we know that this won't be solved in a short period and probably won't be solved with any single piece of legislation. But the goal of getting uh, policymakers, enterprises, and consumers working you know, in some type of, 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 of empath empathic capacity to make this work well on a society, societal basis is gonna be really important. Um, I, wanna, I wanna thank you so much. We went a little long and that's because this was just so darn interesting. Um, like I said, I'm going to put your manifesto link and I'll put a little information about uh, Pega World, which I mentioned earlier in the show, in the show notes that everyone can check it out. But uh, Peter, for this one, I got to say goodbye. Let's uh, let's try to catch up in uh, the next year or so and see how things yeah, are coming. That would be off. awesome. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody, hit that subscribe button. Join us for all of our episodes here on the Future of Tech podcast. I'm Daniel Newman, host, CEO and founder of the Future of Group, saying goodbye for now. See y'all later.